Okay, this video is about normal variants you should know. These are normal variations of anatomy that increase your risk of having a serious uh, medical problem. So the first one is bilateral persistent fetal PCOM with hypoplastic vertebral artery. I'll show you a picture of it in just one second. It'll be real obvious, even though it's a fancy description there. And then spine problems. You can have congenitally narrow canal and cause all kinds of problems. It's like what the football players have that get transient or permanent uh, paralysis. Um, coronary artery ramus intermedius, we'll just sort of finish up with that one. Okay, um, here we're going to be talking about the basilar artery. So the basilar artery is at the base of the skull. That's why it's called basilar artery. And this view is, i got to show you a side view, Going from beneath your chin, your chin's called the mentum, the top of your head's called the vertex, so sub, below, mental, vertex, view. It's just flattening of the arteries at the base of the brain called the circle of Willis. Um, and this diagram is a standard diagram in magnetic resonance angiography in any anatomy book. And these are the blood vessels that supply your brain with blood. So the big one is the ICA, internal carotid artery. By the way, I look at these things every day. Okay, um, MCA is middle cerebral artery. ACA is anterior cerebral artery. ACOM is anterior communicating artery. Here's the A2 ACA. And by the way, understanding what I'm about to tell you is going to help you not have a stroke. Um, and there's a very good reason why I'm showing you these cases. Once you get this, you'll radically lower your risk of having a stroke because you'll understand what it's about. Um, off the basilar artery, you got the posterior cerebral arteries called the, usually labeled PCA. They're all numbered, these segments, for the purpose of being able to describe where aneurysms are. So this is the beginning of the PCA, so it's called the P1 PCA. Then after the posterior communicating artery joins with it, it becomes the P2 PCA, posterior cerebral artery. Just like this would be the A1 ACOM, A1 anterior cerebral artery, A2 anterior cerebral artery. Okay, so the point is here would be a normal sized basilar artery. This would be considered a normal complete circle of Willis, or we call it the COW, C-O-W, COW circle of Willis. Okay, now here's the key normal variant I want you to see. Sometimes these PCOM arteries, posterior communicating arteries right here, normal posterior communicating arteries are really big. And that's considered the fetal type, so the in utero type of posterior communicating artery. And in this case, it will supply the posterior cerebral artery. So the posterior cerebral artery will receive its blood flow from the PCOM, the posterior communicating artery, rather than from the basilar artery. So in this patient, the P1 segments of the posterior cerebral artery are hypoplastic, vestigial, not present. Okay, nothing's going through those P1s. All of the blood flow to the posterior uh, circulation of the brain is coming off the fetal PCOM. And because the basilar artery doesn't need to supply these bilateral posterior cerebral arteries, the basilar artery will often be very small. It's called a hypoplastic basilar artery. And then here we have, here we're looking at it now on what's called a coronal view. That's a front to back view is called coronal view. And this is the right vertebral artery, the left vertebral artery. So the two vertebral arteries come up to the base of the skull, the frame and magnum, and then they join to make the basilar artery that comes straight up. So this basilar artery, its size relative to the internal carotids is very small. Typical internal carotid artery entering the skull is going to be about 6 millimeters. Typical, typical basilar artery should be maybe around you know, 5 millimeters, at least 4 millimeters in that ballpark. Okay, with this persistent hypoplastic uh, anatomy, you can get a basilar artery of about 2 millimeters, 1.5, so it can be really small. Not good. The reason is a really small artery is more vulnerable to occlusion by just simple atherosclerosis. You know, the wall is called mural, mural atherosclerosis layering along the wall. Plus, there's a whole bunch of vessels that come off this basilar segment going into the brain stem. So what's the point of all this? The point is you could have this anatomy. It's relatively common. About 8% of patients have a bilateral persistent fetal PCOMs with associated small basilar artery. So if you've got this anatomy you are at increased risk for a stroke, okay? Now, don't get me wrong, it's easy to prevent a stroke in these patients if you understand. But the reason I show this case is 
Any one of us could have persistent fetal PCOMs bilateral with associated small basilar artery. And we don't know it. You're only going to know it unless you do um, an arteriogram, you know, catheter arteriogram, CT arteriogram, MRA arteriogram. You don't know if you got it. And it's common enough. Okay, I see these every day. Um, and every week, I'll see a brainstem, either silent infarct, ischemia, or frank infarct, or cerebellar infarct. I see them every day. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to show you a little bit more about what this looks like. So here it is on a coronal again. Big honking PCOMs feeding these big PCAs. Oh, I also drew a normal variant. No ACOM here. I have isolated circulation. We don't need to get all the circul collateral circulations. That's a more complex topic. But the bottom line is, any one of us could easily have this hypoplastic basilar. And I'll show you the next picture of that. Okay. Um, so here again is just, you know, carryover from our previous image of the small basilar artery because you got big honking PCOMs and feeding the PCAs. Here it is in the coronal projection front to back, this tiny basilar artery. And now here is a sagittal projection. Sagittal projection means lateral, okay? So looking at it from the side, and this basilar artery is wrapped around the pons. That's part of the brain stem, the belly of the pons that sticks out like a fat person. Okay, so all there's a bunch of little tiny arteries that come off the basilar to feed the pons. And if you severely narrow, which is the medical word is stenose, or occlude this basilar artery, you will infarct your pons. Also, you can infarct the cerebellum because the arteries coming off the um, basilar artery will go to the cerebellum. So what I'm saying is when somebody has this anatomy, they're at markedly increased risk to thrombose this tiny hypoplastic small basilar artery and stroke their brainstem or stroke the cerebellum, and they could be screwed. You know, that could be a big deal. They don't necessarily die, but they could be paralyzed on one side of the body, you know, cerebellar infarcts, they could have lack of coordination, all kinds of problems. So we'll take a quick look at, you know, some more of what that looks like, what that's about. Here's a paper on the subject of bilateral vertebral artery hypoplasia. So those are the vertebral arteries feeding into that small basilar artery with fetal type variants of the posterior cerebral artery. That means, you know, fetal type PCOMs feeding fetal type posterior cerebral artery. So all coming off the anterior circulation leading to hypoplasia of the basilar artery. So the, the point is, these patients get more brainstem, posterior fossa, cerebellum strokes. Um, I'll just show you what that looks like, you know, looking at MRI. So here's an MRI image from this paper. Here's patient number one, patient number two. These are DWI images. That means diffusion-weighted image. It's the best sequence for seeing acute strokes. These bright spots are acute infarcts. So pop, middle cerebellar peduncle, pop, stroke. Um, cerebellar hemisphere, pop, stroke. Paramedian left pons pop, stroke, okay? Um, second patient, something similar, you know? Left posterior lateral pons, psh, about a centimeter diameter infarct, not good. Extension into the middle cerebellar peduncle, pop, cerebellar hemisphere, pop, bilateral, pop, 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 pop. They're trashing their brainstem. These are very serious infarcts. Here's what it looks like on the submental vertex view. You can see here is a large um, PCOM posterior communicating artery going directly into the posterior cerebral artery. Same thing on the other side. So we got bilateral fetal PCOMs with fetal type PCAs, meaning they're all fed from the anterior circulation. The basilar artery is so hypoplastic we can't even see it. Perhaps it's thrombosed. Perhaps it's severely narrowed, you know, um, severe stenosis. And these are probably time of flight technique on the MRAs such that they'll, they're not very sensitive for picking up slow flow and minimal flow in a small um, basilar artery. One might see it better if we did a CT angiogram. But the point I'm making is any one of us could have this anatomy. You don't know if you got it, so why take a chance? And I show this case to teach it because I can't tell you how many stupid people say things to me like, well... You know, my grandfather lived in 95, so I guess I'll take my chances. I'm not going to eat all this junk food. Or I knew a guy who smoked and drank every day, and he lived in 90. Yeah, you know what? There are some exceptions. You know, Audie Murphy survived World War II. Okay, but the point I'm making is any one of us could be very high risk for a stroke with this anatomy. And it's easy. Just eat the, the proper way, low-fat, low-sodium, 100% whole food, vegan, and you'll never have a problem with this, but just be aware you could have this anatomy. So, because people will say to me, you know, how do you get that discipline? My wife said to me, you know, you're an effing robot. You would eat the grass if you thought it would make you healthy. Other people don't want to do that. Normal people don't want to do that. And I'm like, you know what? Ignorant people don't want to do that. There's a very good reason why our human vascular system and metabolic system 
is designed that we should never get atherosclerosis and we should never eat the way modern humans do. Okay, so just avoid that, you'll be fine. All right, now I'm just going to show you one in the coronaries, and I don't do that much. You know, in my fellowship in vascular disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital, I used to dictate cardiac casts. So I was a lot more interested in this many years ago, but the point I want to make is here, here's typical anatomy. Here's the thoracic aorta. Here's the left main coronary artery. That's the one they call the widowmaker, the big one that feeds into the left circumflex artery and to the left anterior descending artery. This is a typical bifurcation. Atherosclerosis tends to happen at bifurcations. This is a hot area for atherosclerosis. But the reason I'm showing it to you is there's a, there's a normal variant called a ramus intermedius. And ramus means like branch, branch of a tree. Um, intermedius is um, just an intermediate vessel between the two. So instead of being a bifurcation of the left main coronary artery, it's a trifurcation of the left main coronary artery. The relevance is there are some papers showing increased risk of left anterior descending atherosclerosis with this anatomy, increased risk of a larger myocardial infarction. Also, the bigger the artery, the easier it is to stent it. The bigger the artery, the, re the easier it is to do a surgical bypass to it. And when you got a trifurcation, three arteries, you're going to have three smaller arteries compared to two bigger arteries. Revascularization can be more difficult. So I'm just saying is these are big macroscopic normal variations that increase your risk of a major complication from atherosclerosis. And none of us knows if we have them or not unless we've had specific diagnostic imaging for this purpose. Plus, for everything we can see on the macroscopic scale, we probably got additional similar situations on a microscopic scale that we can't see, we don't know about. The wise move is to assume that you have this sort of stuff and just live your life as healthy as you can and avoid it. Okay, so here's just a paper. Uh, comparison of culprit lesions in left anterior descending coronary artery patients with anterior wall ST segment, you know, bigger myocardial infarctions having in the ramus branch or not. And here's the conclusion of the paper. Presence of a ramus intermedius was associated with more proximal left anterior descending coronary artery lesions and a larger anterior infarction, suggesting anatomy-induced flow disturbance with important clinical implications. Yep, you don't want it. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at another type of normal variation. And by the way, I see this every day. Okay, so what we're looking here is at the cervical spine. These are the cervical spine vertebrae. You can tell the top one, or you can tell number two, uh, because it's shaped like a tooth. That's what odontoid means, tooth-like. It look, kind of looks like a bowling pin. It kind of looks like a pawn in the game of chess. Um, or perhaps a bishop if you prefer. Anyways, there's seven cervical vertebrae. In between them is a disc. So vertebra number three, intervertebral disc, vertebra number four. Well, there's blood vessels, the uh, vertebral arteries that run along these and supply them with blood. The more atherosclerosis you get in your vertebral arteries, the more you will degenerate these discs. And that'll predispose you to DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. I talked about that in my spine lecture. Also, there's just degeneration of these discs. If anybody's ever looked at MRI reports, you'll see this all day long till the cows come home. DDD, degenerative disc disease, okay? And typically it's a lack of blood flow to the disc. It becomes then uh, the outer layer, the annulus fibrosis fails. The inner layer, the nucleus pulposus then bulges backward. Plus, as the disc fails, you'll start getting little bone spurs here called osteophytes. And why am I showing you this? Because some people have a congenitally narrow cervical spine central canal, meaning that the distance between the back of the spinal canal, the ligamentum flavum it's called, and the disc and the bone, the vertebra, is very small. So all it takes is a little disc bulge and boom, it's pushing on their cord. When the cervical spinal cord is pushed on, you can get a myelopathy. Myelo means for cord, okay? Radical means like a root. So radiculopathy means extending out to a nerve root to your hands or to your feet. That's a radiculopathy. A myelopathy is compression of the cord. And when compression of the cervical cord, a patient can have a problem with both legs, difficulty walking. They can become paraplegic. I'm sorry, at this level, quadriplegic. And the reason I show you, this is the one when somebody's got a tight canal, like the football player, Daryl Stingley in particular, other ones, they can have a tackle and they can get sudden quadriparesis. Uh, might be transient, might be permanent because they have a narrow canal. And so why am I showing you this? Because if you've got this, and you don't know if you got this, and this is relatively common, it doesn't take a lot of atherosclerosis before all of a sudden you've got disc bulge pushing on your cord and you're probably gonna have to go to the operating room. This is one of the best reasons that neurosurgeons do surgery. Because if it's neglected for too long and the cord's really being pushed on, 
you know, they might end up with an infarcted cord, a compression, you can get a compression of the cord, and I've seen tons of cords with uh, loss of tissue uh, called myelomalacia due to compression from degenerative disc disease, and DJD they'll often call it degenerative joint disease, but really they consider DDD a subtype, degenerative disc disease a subtype of degenerative joint disease, and it's all the same thing as OA, osteoarthritis. So I'm showing you this so that when you understand what's at stake, your very health at stake, whether or not you're in pain every day, whether or not you need to go to the operating room, whether or not you have a stroke, it depends on what you eat and avoiding these toxins and stuff. So, you know, the way I look at it, it's a great deal. Thank God there's something that works to prevent atherosclerosis so you don't have to get all this suffering and misery. Not a day goes by that I see a whole bunch of poor, unfortunate, ignorant people stroking out, getting their cord compressed, becoming paraplegic, quadriplegic, demented. And this stuff is all easy to prevent. Just, you know, eat the whole food, vegan, low-fat diet. <laughs>